Good afternoon, everybody. Let's all stand together and lift our hands and give God glory and praise and honor. What a great start this morning to the 2022 Southwest Believers Convention. We're so glad that you're here. Coming up, Jesse Duplantis, Jerry Savelle this afternoon. Are you excited about that? Father, we thank you, we honor you, we praise you for all that are here, all that are watching us from around the world, and we thank you for the living, breathing Word of God that will completely change our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's rock. Would you please welcome Jesse Duplantis? platform here. They must be think we're getting old and they got bigger steps. <laughs> Turn around, shake somebody's hand, tell them you love them and you may be seated for just a minute. <laughs> the Lord is in the house. Praise the name of the Lord. Hello, Fort Worth, my God. The Lord is here. Give Jesus one more hand clap if you don't mind. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's always a high honor to come to the Southwest Believers Convention. And it's just such a blessing. I think this is my 33rd one. 
a 30-second hallelujah. And there's no way I can ever catch Jerry. I think Jerry's done everything, 55 or whatever, something like that. And uh, it's just such a blessing of the Lord. We thank you for coming today. And I hope you can call your friends and tell them, you know, you got a week to get here. Yeah. Now, it's great to watch us online, but we better look it in person. Okay, I'll try something else. Praise God. <laughs> but God has been so good and gracious, and we just thank you today. And my wife is here. Kathy, where are you? Stand, that's Kathy. Stand up. Give to my wife, Kathy. I've been married to that woman 52 years. Can you believe that? 52 years. I know she looks a lot younger, but uh, I travel a lot more. A lot more wear and tear on me, I guess you could say. But God has been so good and gracious. If I look a little tired, I've been running. I mean, I've been preaching every day, and I got in, got to bed about 1.30 this morning and flew here this morning, uh, this, at 1.30 this morning and then got to New Orleans and turned around, got some clothes and ran real fast. And, and everybody's freaking out. But uh, what y'all think of my tennis shoes? Hey! I decided one day, I was in Belfast, Northern Ireland, and uh, I said, where's my shoes? I'm a, you know I'm allowed to use boots. I love boots. Where my shoes? And I had forgot to bring it. And I saw these shoes. And I had more comments on my shoes than I did on my sermons. <laughs> then I got to looking at some of these speakers and all these people on top, and they were in sneakers, I guess you could say. You got some on too, sir? <laughs> yeah, just the way it is. So uh, y'all pray for Jerry and uh, Kenneth. <laughs> they got to, you got, got, got to move on up a little bit here. Praise God. What a blessing. If you got your Bibles, I'd like you to turn with me today to the book of St. John, chapter 20. I'm going to do something I've never done at, actually in any meeting or um, believers' conventions or anything, or even my own ones. And uh, the Lord, I, I had something totally different. The Lord about a week ago began to deal with me about the book I wrote called I Never Learned to Doubt. And I really know nothing of doubt. And he said, I want you to do that during the day sessions, and you'll do something different the night that you preach, which is Wednesday. But uh, and I want to deal with that. Because doubt is the cancer that destroys everything in life, spiritual, physical, and financial. That's why God called us his children. You know why he called us his children? Because children are born believers until you teach them the doubt. They know nothing of doubt until you teach them that. So you shouldn't teach them. I want to deal with that in, the, in my day sessions here. And I want to start with a guy that everybody knows, and that's, that's talking about Thomas. And I want, I want to get into this, and I, I believe you're going to enjoy it. In St. John chapter four, uh, 20, verse, uh, let's start with verse 19. Then the same day as the evening being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. In other words, possession of adequate resource. And when he had said so, he showed to them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. They should have been glad before because he said, if you, if you kill me, I'll be back in three days. So there's a lot of people say one thing and do another. Then said Jesus to them, peace be unto you as my father has sent me, even so send I you, verse 21. Now, verse 22 is very powerful. In my personal opinion, that's where salvation begins. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. See, the Holy Spirit, they were born again right there. And then the day of Pentecost come. They received the breath of the wind of the Spirit. And at and Pentecost, they received the wind of the power. It was a power, a power wind and a, and, a, and a life wind. That was the difference there. And then he said this, which a lot of the Protestants don't like to read. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. And now you can understand why the Catholics at times gives you absolution. If you're a Catholic person, you know what I'm talking about. You go in and you, you confess your sin. Bless me, Father, for I have sins, been so many whatever days since my last confession and things of that nature. Then he says, I absolve you of your sins. This is where they're getting that from. So you can understand that. And, uh, some Protestants get a little mad about that, but Protestants are protesters. <laughs> That's what they are. They're protesters. Yeah. <laughs> now, I'm, not, I'm, not taking, I'm not taking sides. I'm just telling you this is where they got that. <laughs> but Thomas, one of the 12 called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. Now, they, they don't tell us why he wasn't. 
Thomas was a very strong individual. He wasn't as afraid as much as Peter was, as all the other disciples. Because one time Jesus said, I'm going to Bethany, and they said, they're going to kill you then. And they said, man, and they did everything they could to stop him from going. He didn't want to go. Thomas said, let's go die with him. So we only think about the one mistake he made. But this man was powerful. Watch this. But Thomas was one of the 12 called Didymus was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, we have seen the Lord, but he said unto them. Now Thomas is very analytical. He's very smart. He says that he said unto them, except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. In other words, he's very analytical because the crucifixion struck Thomas probably harder than all the other 11. He saw it. He said, this is impossible. It, is, it really hurt him. And he said, this can't be. Now watch this. Verse 26, and after eight days, again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. I'm going to read a little scripture, then I'm going to get into this. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, peace be unto you. Now, what was the difference? He's got that new body, our body. See when I do this? This, this, this pulpit is made up of, of molecules and atoms. My hand can't get through them. But my new body, when I receive that, I'll be able to go in between the atoms and the molecules. That's how Jesus could walk through the doors. And if you want to try to understand that, uh, Star Trek. <laughs> Beam me up, Scotty. Now, we laugh at that, but there's something to that where they can get in between the molecules because they make you molecules and that, switching in to get through solid objects and things of that nature. And after eight days, again, his disciples were with him and, G and Thomas was with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands. Reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. Because he heard, Jesus heard him say, I will not believe. In other words, you can't convince me. And Thomas answered and said to them, my Lord and my God. His intellectual activity, his range in research, his induction and in reason went out the door, and his intellectual pride dried up right there. You got to be very careful when people try to decipher things in Scripture to such a degree, trying to put stuff in there and doing everything they possibly can, and then all of a sudden, that's all intellectual activity, range and research and induction and reasoning and all that kind of stuff. But you got to be careful that it doesn't turn into intellectual pride. You see, let me just tell you something here. Let me show you what I got. You see, you got to be careful with that. He says, my Lord and my God, verse 29, Jesus said, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen. Hmm. So it's better not to see than to see, empowered to prosper, and yet have believed. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Now, know somebody's name. His name is not on you. His name is not around you. That's on the angel. That's on Michael and Gabriel and all those guys. The name of God, of God is on them. But the name of God is in you. You have become a biological part of who God is. He said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. Angel said, what's a man? Never heard of a man. Didn't know what that was. And see, that's why Satan couldn't get over it. Wait a minute. Not only are you made in the express image of God, you are literally what's in him is running in you. And when you get your new body, the way I say it best is, instead of having blood, you'll have liquid God in your veins. You understand what I'm saying? Thomas was very, very courageous. He was willing to die, do everything, but he was also very strong in things that he saw. And his intellect stopped him. He said, this cannot be. I saw them crucify him. I saw the nails and the skin bust in half when they put those spikes in and when they put that spear in his side. And he said, I will not. In other words, you will not convince me. I got to put my fingers in there. I have to, you see. In other words, this is all intellect talking. 
Write this down if you're taking notes. Doubt will not let you look at the bright side of things. Doubt will not let you look at the bright side of things. Doubt is very temperamental. It's easily disturbed. It can get very angry. Who do you think you are to tell me this and tell me that? And we, we, we even use these oxymorons. If, if, I, if, I, if I see it, I'll believe it. But when you believe it, see it, you go, I, be, I see it, but I don't believe it. Because you're so temperamental. See, doubt will not let you look at the bright side of things. Now, I have no doubt, and I'm going to say this strong on, on television for the world to say, I have no doubt in me. You're looking at a vision specialist. I don't mean that prideful or an arrogant way, but I know I ain't believing. I quit believing years ago. All that stuff, trying to convince yourself that it's going to work. I'm believing, I'm believing, I'm believing. Standing on the way, wait, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm trying to get this to work. When you know in whom you have believed, it makes no difference what the world's doing. That's the Apostle Paul. You can beat him. I bear the marks of a Christian. You can do whatever you want. I don't care what you do. I know in whom I have believed. See, so doubt will not let you look at the bright side of things. Now, don't get crazy with this thing. See, this is impossible. You got to remember, God never shows up until it's impossible. Right. Possibility is for you. That's your job. When it gets impossible or you can't, then God shows up. But yet, it's very temperamental because it says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, 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 no. This can't be. Two plus two is four. Is it? Who told you that? Well, your teachers. Well, how do you know they were right? When is the last time you did a research on mathematics? How many of you know what E equals MC square means? Energy equals matter times the speed of light square. Uh, even Einstein, he would say, he said, it's actually a very simple formula. Yeah, to you. <laughs> the difference was he believed it, they didn't. He had the law of relativity in his mind before, and he had to come up with a formula for them to understand that. And even till today, a lot of great physicists are temperamental. That's why most of them don't believe in God. Yet it takes more faith to believe what they say about the universe than us, God being the creator of things. Why? Because doubt is temperamental. See what I'm saying? It, it, it doesn't let you look at the bright side of things. Well, yeah, I mean, you, you can't get that. I mean, you can't believe in that prosperity message. It, that's only one small facet of the Bible. Because I'm going to make this announcement. If you don't, listen to me, look at me. If you don't believe in prosperity, you can't go to heaven. You're going to get mad, you ain't going to like it. You're going to walk into heaven, there's going to be gold streets and diamonds and barrels and jasper, onyx, ruby. Wait, wait, wait. Pearls so big, big as a whole gate, one pearl, one gate. What you going to tell Jesus? No, Jesus. This ain't right, Jesus. He going to say, go to hell. <laughs> Don't shout me down. Because you got to go. If you can't handle that here, how you going to handle that there? That's not cussing in Louisiana. That's a location. It's telling you where to go. Well, you tell everybody else where to go. Hello. See, his intellect was ahead of his faith, which makes doubt Temperamental, write this down. The intensity of faith will sometimes make the light of the gospel invisible. The intensity of faith will sometimes make the light of the gospel invisible. They'll say that it's too good to be true. That's too, it, it, it can't be true because you see, intellectual pride tells you you can't. You see, how many of you know your mother and father? How do you know they are? Have you done a DNA test? How you know they are? You just believe it, right? And there's some people found out later on that wasn't their mama. One of the greatest Hollywood actors found out at, at his, uh, he, he thought his aunt's death, that she was done, that she was the actual, his mother. And he was in uh, Five Easy Pieces. You know who I'm talking about? Y'all yeah, don't watch movies, do you? Easy Rider. He played Jimmy Hoffa. 
I'm trying to get somebody to give me a name here. Who? No, not Peter Fonda. Who? Who? <laughs> Who'd you say it was? Jack Nicholson. That's correct. On the deathbed of his aunt, he finds out she's his mama. All right. Blew him away. I mean, that was a big Hollywood story. Now, you, you don't think that's shocking? A lot of people say, yeah, but you look like your mom and dad. There are a lot of people who look like each other. I never forget I was on a Delta airplane many, many years ago, and I had wrote my first book on the ministry of cheerfulness. It's a literally small book, you know. And so I put, you know, and I noticed that on the Delta, they had magazines in there. So I put one of my books in there. <laughs> well, somebody, you want to read something? And I was sitting in the aisle seat, and a man, he had the window seat, so he gets in. And I didn't say nothing, you know, and I just, like, he looks at me and goes, how you doing? I said, fine, how you doing? And, you know, he starts looking around, looking for something to read, and he pulls out my book. He goes, and he, he reads about maybe two pages of it. He goes, hmm. And he turns it over, and there's a picture of me like this. <laughs> hey. So he goes. <laughs> he looks, it's a true story. He looks at the book, he goes. He said, excuse me, sir. This guy looks just like you. I said, let me see that. And I took the book and I went, boy, it's true, isn't it? But they say you have a double everywhere. I said, what does it say? He says, good stuff. I said, maybe you ought to read it all. I never told him any different. I never told him any different. The intensity of faith will sometimes make the light of the gospel invisible. It's just too good to be true. Stupid. I never forget my mother. I, I love the, you know, but my, we were raised very poor, and, and I'm not ashamed of that. My mom and dad did the best they could, you know, that kind of stuff. And I, me and my brother were in an eight foot wide, 32 foot trailer sleeping on the floor. I was about five and a half, six years old, something like that. And I don't know where my mama got this television, because a lot of things showed up at our house, you know, fell off the truck. <laughs> uh, things, things happen, you know. We, we, we street smart people, you understand know what I'm saying? Anyway, and we're watching Gone with the Wind. And I remember sitting on the floor, and I see Scarlett O'Hara when they open up the doors at 12 Oaks, and you see that beautiful white staircase. And I looked at that, and I look at my mama, she's looking at it too, you know. And you know, coming from a trailer, that's big. And I said, Mama, I'm gonna build a house like the movies. My mama said, shut up, boy. You're sleeping on the floor <laughs> in a trailer. And I remember it hurt my feeling, but I didn't say nothing. Now, you know, children don't say that. They don't believe that kind of stuff. See, mama's doubt was temperamental. It was just too good to be true. This is a movie. This is a story. It's Hollywood. It's all fake. I built that house. I have the Gone with the Wind staircase in my foyer of my home. I sent it to the, uh, the movie, to the, what they call it, the architect, I said, build it, exactly like it. So my foyer is 1,600 square foot to put that staircase in there. <laughs> Are you bragging? I am. Carolyn, you've been on it many times. Yeah, am I telling the truth? That thing, you go, woo. Now I'm not bragging about that. You see, my mama thought, that's just too good to be true. Because you're judging yourself where you are instead of where you should be. Amen. See, I never learned to doubt. Now, I didn't know much about church, so I didn't have to unlearn some things. I never figured I was preaching, how long, Kathy, six to eight months, and Nancy, someone asked me this, oh, who are you ordained with that? Who are you ordained with? I said, do I need that? <laughs> I didn't know what that was. I never heard that before. He said, yeah. I said, well, what is that? I said, oh, I guess I need that. I, we didn't know. I never heard of the word tithe until Kathy showed it to me. I thought it said tires. <laughs> I said, God is my witness. The truth, you've heard me say it before. Because I saw a bus when we drove into the church. I said, well, and he said, it's time to receive the morning tithe and offering. It was tires. I thought he said, I said, I said, the church needs some tires? God he said, no. And she had been saved two, a little over two years, maybe almost two and a half, something like that. She said, no, no. I said, well, what we? she said, 
tithe. I said, what's that? You give 10% of your income. I said, is that in the Bible? And she, she said, yeah. She went over to Malachi. Now, when I saw it, I thought it was Malachi. <laughs> I was raised with a bunch of Sicilians. You understand? <laughs> you do what you're going to do. And then they, the, the pastor went there, and he said in verse 8, will a man rob God? And I remember saying, not in my neighborhood, Jack. Ain't nobody robbing nothing. <laughs> Because your, your face is going to be in the bottom of a ditch. Real quickly, where's Fred? <laughs> See, the intensity, Thomas said, this can't be. It can't. I was there. Maybe he had some of Jesus' blood spilled on him when they spew, hit him with that, and water and blood blew out of him. Write this down. The most blessed state to live in is to believe without physical proof. Now we're talking faith now. The most blessed state to live in is to believe without physical proof. That's Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now you can go to it, or I, can, I can quote it. Now faith is, not tomorrow, not next week, now. Quit putting it in the future. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. No physical proof. Right. None. Right. It's the greatest state of mind and body and spirit that you can live in because there's no doubt in yeah. it at all. Yeah. Yeah. That's I never learned to doubt, so I knew nothing about that. So. They told us, don't read the Bible, so we didn't. You know, we, and this is not against the Catholic Church, but they said only the priest can interpret the Bible. And I, I didn't even pray because you don't talk to God, you talk to the priest. Anybody been Catholic know what I'm talking about? You know, am I telling the truth here? You talk to the priest. You know, so when I first read the Bible, I had no doubt. They said, that's the Word of God. I heard all my life. The priest said, that's the Word of God. That's holy canon. So when I read the Bible, I went, wow. That's God's words. And I read some of the most impossible things, but it was so simple to believe because it was God's word. Because there was no doubt. Satan couldn't build any foundation of unbelief on because there was none there. So when I began, to, and God gave me this statement years ago, believe the unbelievable, receive the impossible because it's doable. So everything I'm believing for, is completely unbelievable and impossible. And Nancy, I like what you tell me. You said, Jesse, you, you give us figures. Yeah, I, like that. I, like I like numbers. You know what I'm saying? Now, and I got, and I don't mean this, I'm not confessing anymore. I'm possessing. Yeah. Yeah. I heard Keith Moore a while ago, he said, yeah, my, my God, and I like that, my God, will shall supply all my need. I have to change it for me. My God has supplied. I have no needs. Not sure. I have no needs. Amen. I got a lot of wants. Amen. See, and I never tell God what I need. You've heard me say it so many times. I tell him what I want. How many of you need some money? Hold your hand up. Don't lie. Hold your hand up. You need some money. <laughs> you know, if money is so bad, how come you have a hard time giving it away? <laughs> if it's bad, you know, if you eat something bad, don't you spit it out? Mm, God, this is bad. Get. It's not bad. Money ain't bad. It's the love of money that is. You live in an economic world. That's right. right. Yep. So I, th I told my mother I would be a millionaire. My, this is right before she died. Oh, couldn't get there. Oh, it's too good to be true. Yet, I, I, me and Kathy, we paid their house off, bought them cars, and done that. And even though those things at one time was unbelievable for her to even believe it, but she still couldn't get to that point. And then I was right, driving in a van on I-10, and I was listening to Six Steps of Excellence of Ministry by Kenneth Copeland. I didn't know who he was, but I sure liked it. And he came out with a, a verse in the book of Romans, verse, uh, Romans 13, owe no man anything but to love him. And I thought, well, that goes against my theology of how to handle money, because you use other people's money, that's why everybody goes to the banks and borrow it. Nobody ever thought that you could be the bank. Oh, yeah. I said, but that's what God said. Well, then now from now on, I'm going to become the bank. Amen. 
Here you get this up here. Who do you think you are? A bank. <laughs> you still hadn't got it. You see my point? The most blessed state to live in is to believe without physical proof. You got to confess before you possess. So he has, he has supplied money. Now, I, I, the shall part is not that. He has. And it's just so wonderful. Write this down. Sometimes we need to be brought to the end of our wits that we may come to the beginning of our faith. You got to get to the point where you just say, I don't know. We, sometimes we need to be brought to the end of our wits. It's beyond intellectual reasoning. And that you, that you may come to the beginning of our faith. Amen. You know, I have been rawly persecuted because of jets. I'll give you one better night. You want to report something? Look at Kathy. She's going to freak on that. Let me help you in there. You know all that jet stuff y'all been eating my lunch? I got the jet and I got the money too. <laughs> That's called the double. Yes. Is the double in the scripture? Is, is the double in the scripture? Yes. Well, I read that. Yes. Doc, I read it. I said, well, let's double. Amen. And I heard this song. Tell me something good. Uh -uh. Tell me, tell me. I said, the double. Oh, but you can't have you What? What do you mean you can't? You must have learned that at the church. They said, we'll kill you, Jesus. He said, I'll be back in three days. <laughs> Good God. Oh, Ephesians 5, 1. Be ye therefore imitators of who? Oh, oh God. I never learned to doubt. I know nothing of doubt. And when someone says, you can't do this, I smile. I said, that's a word from God that I can do all. <laughs> and I just smile at them. You know, I, I don't try to hurt people. I, I don't, I just smile. And then when they get it, they say, I just could not, I can't believe. Why is that? They say, they say, I just can't believe it. You did it. I said, you live in the state of can't believe all your life. One day you're going to say, I can't believe I'm dying, but you are. <laughs> Why do you have to have a jet? Well, I've been down in three airplane crashes. So I want one that's safe. I want to know when I get on it that it's working, that it's perfect and entire. We just flew from New Orleans. We had Rick and Denise with us. Uh, Rick preached for Kathy uh, Sunday morning. And so I invited, I said, listen, I mean, you're going to the Believers Convention. I said, uh, y'all want to ride with us? Yeah. And, uh, and Denise would look and she said, how long are we going to be there? Was it an hour and five minutes or less? something like that? We're doing almost 600 miles an hour. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. <laughs> oh, I'm making some people mad right now. And I'm not bragging on me. I, this is this God. I'm not going to be a Thomas. I don't have to put my hands in his prints, my hands in his side. And I'm not going to be hiding with a bunch of people flat scared to walk out because of somebody wanting to kill me. Mm-mm. Sometimes we need to be brought to the end of our wits that we may come to the beginning of our faith. See, when you get it all, I like what, uh, Paul Crouch was a, a great friend of mine. He's in heaven. And I love this definition of faith. He said, go as far as you can almost, and then take one more step. That was uh, Paul Crouch's uh, definition of faith. I love that. Go as far as you can uh, and then take one more step. Yeah. I had to come to the end of my wits so that I could see the beginning of my faith. In other words, I had to die to self. Now, thank God when I got born again, I just believed the Gideon Bible. I, th I stole it. <laughs> well, I was barely saved. You got to give me a chance here to sanctify myself. And I gave them a good donation. I, I blessed them real good. You know, <laughs> you know? And they said, you can't steal a Gideon Bible. I said, I stole your Bible, man. I took it out the hotel. And what's so wonderful, we were living in hotels all the time when I was, when I was playing music, and you could mark your place in, in Los Angeles and go to the New York and be in the same Bible on the same page. <laughs> That's nice. How many of you preachers can't preach with someone else's Bible? See, it's hard. 
because you not only do you see the scripture, you notice the page, you, you notice where the verses are, and all of a sudden you got somebody else by them, they got a different, uh, you go, wait a minute, where, 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 where's, my, where's my verse? So you got to come to the end of your wits. God will bless each and every one of you beyond your wildest dreams if you're willing to take the persecution of it, because I'm going to tell you something, it's not only going to come from the world, and I can expect that, it's going to come from the church. See, the church wants to be rich, but they want you to be poor. The church wants you to take a vow of poverty, but the church ain't, I'm going to be no poor. Mm-mm, mm-mm. And when actually poverty is a curse. See, if you believed in poverty, none of you could be here. Why? You had to either drive here or fly here. And I don't think you're living in your car. I don't know if you are or not, but most of you got hotels, right? They expect you to pay it. So you got to have some faith. You see what I'm saying? So, you see, when I wrote this book, I never learned to doubt. I thought, you know, I think I've had it easier than most people because I wasn't religiously brainwashed. I wasn't religious at all. I never could understand how God could forgive me my sins. That was a tough one for me till I heard the word expunge. The word expunge means when the, when the legal departments of the world expunge your record, it never existed. And when I began to realize that, and I learned it in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, and I like old Brother Hagin, when he say, anytime there's a therefore in the Bible, find out what it's there for, if you remember him used to say that. Therefore, if anybody be in Christ, I said, well, that's me. I'm a new creature. Oh, I'm a new create. Whoa. Old things have passed away. I said, that's almost like Forrest Gump. Well, then I just don't have to worry about that no more. <laughs> so old things don't bother me. Amen. Why? I'm a new creation. Yeah. Well, I know it says that, but no, no, no. No, no, no. Quit, quit going on with the conjunctions. You're a new creation. New creature, new creation. Yep. A new creation can't be an old creation. He didn't pick you up and try to sew, and sew a patch on you right. Right. on an old garment. He gave you one brand new, yeah. new, yeah. just new. Yeah. My God. See, but you got to come to the end of your wits sometimes so you can see the beginning of your faith. So I just begin to walk by faith and not by sight. People say, that must be hard. No. I, I must have had at least, and I'm going to say conservatively in 46 years of preaching the gospel, I'm going to say this is a conservative. At least 600 preachers have told me, boy, you're going to struggle. Never have. Never have had a financial deficit. Why? Didn't believe for it. I followed Jesus' life. He didn't either. He said to be imita imitate him. But the teaching apostles did. The apostle James had money problems. The apostle John had money problems. The apostle Paul had money problems. The apostle John had money problems. Because they always, lot, all of them made excuses for finance. God was trying to bless Paul. He said, I work with my own hands. I make tents. I'm doing fine. Well, that's great. That's good. But he had to correct that in the next epistle. He said, I, I, I asked you to figure, because I, I, I didn't receive from you. Then you hear him say, I have all and I'm full. Because I have received from Ephroditus. Not take. There's a vast difference between receivers and takers. You know, I have people come up and they'll say, you know, brother, I'm believing for a watch just like this. L <laughs> let the Lord lead you. I said, he is right away from you. I ain't going that way. <laughs> you know, yeah, that's a religious con artist if there ever was one. See, doubt gives you mental anemia. Write that down so you'll understand. Doubt gives you mental anemia. And beware of mental anemia. I'd rather be a fanatic than be stagnant or apathetic. I'd rather be a fanatic than be stagnant or apathetic. They just had a major denomination put in their constitution bylaws. We will not believe in speaking in tongues. We will not believe in the prosperity message. We will not believe in healing. They just haven't got sick enough yet. Isn't that amazing? Oh, but them word of faith guys, they, 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 you know, they, they, uh, you know, they, they just think they can get anything. Yes. 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 You got it. Yes. Yes. Have to watch what we say because we get it. 
And we're not moving. I mean, I have heard people tell me this at once, I, at least a hundred times in all these years. Man, don't ask Jesse the Prince to come to your town or Jerry Seville or Kenneth Copeland or that Keith Moore or that Bill Winston or Creflo A. Dollar Jr. They'll suck all the money out of the city and you ain't got nothing left. <laughs> I'm telling you, it happens all the time they say that. And yet they don't know what the Scripture says. God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you always having all sufficiency in all things, watch this, may abound to every good work. So your church is not going to hurt to have me. That's right. Okay. Or Kenneth, or Cravelo, or Jerry, or okay. Keith, or Bill Winston, or Jeremy Pearson, or George, or... Ter they ain't do that. Now, either you lying or God lying. <laughs> I pick you. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's mental anemia. Yeah, that's See, you're anemic. Yeah. I'd rather be a fanatic than be stagnant or apathetic. See, that was the problem with my mom. She was stagnant or apathetic because they convinced her that's all she could ever do. I talked to a, a, a prostitute not too long ago. <laughs> I ain't the ugliest man in the world. I get hit on, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and I looked at her and I said, I'd like to ask you something. And she's looking for some money. You know, she's trying to make a living. I said, who told you this is all you can ever do? And she just looked at me. I said, I don't doubt you're a very smart person, but somebody told you that's all you could ever do. I've come to tell you you can do anything through Christ. She just looked at me. The whole conversation changed from something sexual to future. I said, somebody made you believe that's all you can do. When that's simply not true. I said, you're not a bad person. God don't create bad people. You may have done bad things and so have I, but my record's been expunged. Amen. And you know what time is all over now? So I got tears in this woman's eyes. She's freaking out. Why? Because I told her she could do something else than that. Women can't preach. <laughs> Women can't pastor. <laughs> Let me give you two words. Yo mama. <laughs> Yo mama. I was just on Flashpoint and, and Hank was eating my lunch. God created Adam and he went, ah, I can do better. Yeah. <laughs> and he created Eve. And we've been run by women ever since. See, write this down. Spiritual progress can only be attained by strong belief. So I am believe. I had a guy, let me, let, me, let me say the point that I'm going to tell you this. Spiritual progress can only be attained by strong belief, Rick. Strong. I had a guy not too long ago, but maybe three months ago. He said, how much money would it take to shut your mouth? <laughs> he mad at me, you know. I looked at him, I said, he thought I was going to go, I said, $6,364,000,000. You, you got a check? He said, what? I said, $6,364,000,000. You got a check? He goes, no. Then I said, well, shut up. <laughs> he didn't think I had a figure. And then said, I had a figure. I know exactly what I'm believing for. I know exactly what I'm going to get. I know in whom I have believed. I know it will be. Why? because I have no doubt. How long does it take? You think I worry about that? I'm an eternal being. Amen. How many times? You think Paul was scared we're going to cut your head off? He said, no, no, you can't take my head off. I, I, gotta, I got to have a head to put a crown of righteousness on. I'm got about ready to go to heaven. I've been wanting to get out of here for a long time. All Paul wanted to do was die, trying to get out of here. He said, but for your sake, I got to hang around here. <laughs> Timothy, what's your problem? Come on, boy, suck it up. I can give you a spirit of fear. No, Timothy should have been encouraging Paul. But Timothy probably watch he hawk Gloom and despair and agony on me. <laughs> Deep, dark depression, excessive misery. God, God, I'm in trouble here. Spiritual progress can only be attained by strong belief. Now, when you're going through the test, if you've got strong belief and faith and you're beyond your wits, 
you're in a perfect place for God to show up and show out. Amen. I said this here one time, I believe it's going to, I want to close because I don't want to take Jerry's time. Was this, I, I, was, I was flying, I, I believe it was Delta. I used to fly Delta a lot before I got my own planes and things of that nature. Make a long story short, I always tried to get an aisle seat bulkhead so I could have a little bit more room on the plane or whatever. Not that I got long legs, I got short legs, you know, I'm short and all that kind of stuff. But I couldn't get my normal seat, so I had to take a, 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 a window seat by the wings. So I went in there and I'm sitting there and I got my Bible out like this. You know? You know, and, I'm reading, and this man comes in, and he has, I had A, he had a C. It was A, B, C. So he puts his stuff up in the, uh, you know, stuff up, and he sits down like that. Hey, pretty well-dressed guy, you know. I don't know who he is. never seen him before in my life. This is many years ago. And he looks around, and he sees me, he goes, and he looks at the Bible, you know. He says, excuse me. And I said, yes, sir. You a preacher? I said, yes, sir. He said, I don't believe any of you blankety blank and they use the F word and everything else. And what I wanted to do, <laughs> but I did not yield. I said, Lord, I'm going to lift my hands and praise you. <laughs> but, but, oh, I, I, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to break your face. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but I didn't. He goes, huh. And then he pulls out a Hustler magazine, opens up to the centerfold. Hey, preacher. What do you think of that? Now, everybody in the thing going, oh, oh. I mean, it's kind of appalling. So I said, hmm. I switched over to the gospel, to the red parts. And I said, well, what do you think of that? So, <laughs> and I saw the Hustler magazine starting to do this. I said, what do you think about it? What do you think? I said, one day, you're going to walk, these, walk across these pages of Holy Writ. Mark my words, buddy. Have a nice day. <laughs> Went back to reading my Bible. This is when you could smoke on a plane. We got into some turbulence. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, would you please put out your cigarettes? We're going to be uh, having some turbulence here. And please fasten your seatbelt and everything. So, everybody, that's like, boom, 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 boom. I mean, it started getting black out there. Clouds getting around us. I saw them going up, going down. I said, they can't go over this. They certainly can't go through it because they got hail in there and it'll bust holes in them wings. You know, a lot of people don't know that, but it, it can get rough. You don't mess with thunderstorm. People said they went through the thunderstorm. That's a lie. They went through the middle of the edge of it. You get when they super, uh-uh, they're going to tear that plane apart. Watch this. And I thought, man, the lightning, and I thought, you know, and I'm just, sitting, I'm just still reading my about His Hustler magazine, it disappeared. I don't know where he did with it. He, he ain't looking at her no more. <laughs> so I still read, and I do this, watch my head. I just happened to turn to look, and when it, ba bam, the lightning hits the plane, boom, hits the engine, boom, she blows up, fire coming out the front and fire flowing out the back. And I look like that, and everybody goes, and people scream, whoa! And all of a sudden the plane goes, mm, like this. <laughs> people start screaming, now, we like this. But thank God I got my Bible like this. <laughs> and this atheistic fool says, first thing he says, oh my God! I, I couldn't help it. I said, hey, he don't exist. Enjoy your death. <laughs> I said, your guts and blood are going to be spilled all over. Everything is going to be just ripped apart. <laughs> I said, you're going to walk across the pages, boy. People screaming. I should have received an offering. I would have got all the back tied and everything you could think of. Lord, I could have paid for the church cash right there. <coughs> True story. Well, that, that pilot went from 33,000 feet, wow, trying to and try to stabilize that plane. And he got the fire out. I don't know how he does that, whatever he did, you know. And I looked at the guy, and everybody going, ooh, ooh. And there was one lady like this, hey, oh, Mary, for the great, the Lord is with thee, bless on that moment, bless on that day. Hey, oh, how far? He's saying the rosary. If you, had a, had a, if you had a string of pearls that would ripped them off your neck, I'm a father, heart in heaven, I'm trying to I mean, hit your son. And Baptists will speak in tongues when that's going down. <laughs> and when we landed, we hit that runway sideways because, you know, the, the reverse thrusters on that engine, you know, and they, they're fighting that thing. And, you know, these guys are trained so good. 
Finally, and I looked at that man and I said, you better thank God I was on this plane. He looked at me and says, oh, hey, I'm sorry, sir. I said, you don't have to tell me you're sorry. I know you're sorry. I, I, I knew that immediately when I saw you. <laughs> Sometimes you got to do what you got to do. I said, but you better thank God. I said, this thing is a lie because I'm here. And there was the lady who said, I know him and I believe him. <laughs> now, I didn't know who she was. But they're so funny. All of a sudden, the Delta captain says, we want to thank you for flying Delta in the future. If you're traveling, <laughs> people, all they want to do, get off the plane. Just get off the plane. Just in case it blows up. <laughs> See, if I had not been at the end of my wits, I would have been disturbed. But I knew that death and life was in the power of my tongue. And I don't do foolish things, don't misunderstand me. In other words, I maintenance my planes, I do all the plane, not planes. <laughs> Lord Jesus. Uh, I make sure it's right. I do my part, and God does his part. Did you enjoy it here at this first session? <laughs> now, in, 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 the next, in the next section, my day says, I'm going to deal with this. When faith is weak, it suspends your judgment. Some people have excellent sight, but poor perception. I'm going to deal with it. I never learned to doubt. We're not called to believe until we're able. We're called to simply trust. So we'll get into the next day section on this. I never learned to doubt. I said, I'm going to tell you something. Doubt is mental anemia. I have none of it. I don't mean that private. Please don't take it as such. I just, I don't know nothing about that. I just believe this. Have you ever have been tested? Oh, all the time. Don't make no difference, you know. The devil can do what he wants. That's all he's got. Oh, I did tell the devil that after I took care of that little, that little prostitute, got her, got her straight and got her life. Uh, I said, Satan, that's all you got? You think that's going to bother me? You think I'm going to fall for that, you idiot? That is an old thing, not her, that. I said, I'm going to see you go down there. I'm going to see you throw it in the lake of fire. A bottomless pit sucker, you are going down. Oh, he don't like that. But it's truth. You see, that's God's word. Don't notice, in other words, it's wonderful to be a disciple. Remember, Thomas is a disciple of God. But you don't want to never say, I will not believe. You got problems there. There's something in you that needs to come out. Except, I always got some little excuse. And then when you see the Lord of glory, oh, Lord, oh. no, 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 come here. Put your hand in those prints. And I'll tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. In 1988, I went to heaven. I seen, and let me tell you something, that's not scars. Look at me. If, it, if the light can get it, them holes are this big. See right through them. That's some big spikes. That's not some little nail. That spike, that's like a, almost like, but well, not like a railroad tie spike, but I'm pretty close. You can imagine the excruciating pain when that goes through your feet, your hands. But he did that for us. So the, if he did that for me, the least I can do is not doubt his word. Amen. Now, I'm not going to say this, then I'm going to receive the first offering for, the, for this wonderful convention. I like both testaments. I like the old, yes. I like the new, because Jesus is the center of both, yes. one leg in the old, one leg in the Amen. new. And I understand dispensations and times and all that kind of stuff. But I like reading about Abraham, getting blessed and missing it. I like reading about Isaac getting blessed and missing it. I, I love reading about Jacob getting blessed and missing it. It gives me examples not to follow and examples to follow. Yeah. And then when I get over into the new, well, I'll just ask the question. Uh, you know, the New Testament started with the book of Acts. Really? You don't think it started when he breathed upon them to receive the Holy Spirit? Hmm? Yeah. Salvation came in. The wind of life came in those boys. And then a few days later, the wind of power came into them. 
Life without power is useless. Power without life is useless. That's why it's two separate entities. See, I think that's when it started. Now, I ain't going to fight you on the law and grace and all this other kind of stuff. Just do what you got to do. I'm going to just believe it all. I am. I just like the scripture. I do. I just enjoy it. I like to hear Joseph talk the way he talked. And my God, he gets mad at his daddy because his daddy switches his hand on Ephraim and Manasseh. He goes, oh, look at it. He said, well, why would, you, why would Joseph say that? It, they did it for him. Sometimes we forget. Yep. I like when he named when his boy said, the Lord has made me to forget. But he didn't like Jacob switching his hands. Well, a new order took place right there. I'm pretty sure Moses' sons did not like Joshua getting the top slot. <laughs> Wait a minute. I'm his son. But they didn't do what Joshua did. Now watch this. Joshua gets the top slot, and then when it's his time for to go on, his sons didn't get it because they didn't do what their daddy did. They were not servants. You see, we're sons that serve and daughters that serve. So to me, if you're a woman and you got a word from God, tell me, and I'm not going to say, uh, you know, I don't know if I can accept that because you're a female. That's ridiculous and stupid. The Lord's speaking if you will listen. Give Jesus a hand clap for that. I never learned to die. Now, we've got three more parts to this on the day sessions, and I'll do something totally. I'll tell you what I'm going to preach on on Wednesday night. Frustration of the end times. Mm. Oh, you're going to learn something on this. I'm going to deal with Trinity language so you'll know the difference between the Father's voice, the Son's voice, and the Holy Spirit's voice. Three totally distinct and yet separate, yet one. So you know who's talking to you at the time because you have a spirit voice, you have a soulish voice, and you got a body voice. Yet you won. It's going to be wonderful. In just a minute, ushers, if you'll pass out the offering envelopes, this is the first offering toward Kenneth Copeland's outreaches. Let's make a, give God a great shout. The budget is met. Isn't that wonderful? My God, the first afternoon service, the budget met. Now, let me tell you something about Kenneth Copeland Ministries. Now, I'm not saying that because I'm a friend with Kenneth and Gloria, and we are. I'm on the board of directors of Kenneth Copeland Ministries. Look at me. I know everything that's going on in that ministry. Every dollar, everything. We have long board meetings. They tell me, look at George. <laughs> Everything. Jerry's own, Carolyn's own, Kathy's own. We know it all. And you know, Brother Copeland, Sister Gloria, Brother Copeland ain't looking to slow down. He doesn't know how old he is. <laughs> or if he does, he doesn't, doesn't talk about it. And he's ever reaching to go on every available voice. And there's so, vo- there's so many voices. Do you hear one saying this? Kenneth, Gloria. Come over here and preach this uncompromised gospel. Can you hear the words for Paul? Come over to Macedonia. That's an available voice. That's what your giving is going to. And when you get to heaven, people will come up there and grab you and hug you and say, listen to me, thank you for being a partner with KCM. Because through them, I came to the knowledge of God. And then I learned how to live on earth like as if I'd be living in heaven. See, so I ask you to do your best because I know what this ministry does and I know it's outreaches and we discuss it and we debate it. Not, we don't argue, we debate because, uh, you know, and, and, and come up with decisions. All of us sitting there, anyone can say whatever they want, when they want, where they want and how they want, express opinions, and we iron sharpeneth iron. And it's just amazing. Well, I'll just tell you the truth. I've been with them all these years. I have never been anywhere, and I've been all over the world other than China. I have never been anywhere, anywhere 
that someone did not come up to me and say, tell Kenneth and Gloria I'm their partner. That blesses me so much. When I first went to Australia, I hit the front pages of the newspapers there. They said, Kenneth Copeland's sidekick has come to town. <laughs> I felt like Gabby Hayes and Kenneth was Roy Rogers. <laughs> Amazing. We flew to Guadalcanal, me, Kenneth, and Jerry. Guadalcanal, way out in the Pacific Ocean. Bugs as big as your fist. I'm telling you, man, brother, brother Coleman ate a couple of them. He went, oh, boy, that was tasted good, didn't it? I said, mm, I, kept, I, I preached like this. I don't, want, I don't eat them bugs. But you know, Jerry's all God's favorite all the time. He always says it. Me and Kenneth, we, we, I closed Kenneth's Bible, and if I didn't have 50 bugs in it, I'm not lying. Just, I mean, just crazy. Jerry's night, they ain't one bug. I looked at him, he said, I am God's favorite. <laughs> That's a true story, I'm not kidding. <laughs> to go preach in that place, and so many men gave their supreme sacrifice to die that I would be free in World War II. Guadalcanal was a terrible place, and a lot of men died. Brother Copeland said, let's go. I said, let's go. They have a video of it, and I, I gave the first altar call, 1,000 first-time conversions. I don't know if they got it. They got a show. They got it. It's a, it, in a soccer field. I mean, big old thing. There it is right there. Look, that's all first-time conversions. Notice you can't see me. You're not supposed to. But those people heard. That's amazing to me. Now, that's just one nation. That's what your money's going toward. Now, he believes in the hundredfold, so do I. So why can't you? And why won't you receive it? And don't make an excuse for it. If somebody says, oh, well, I'll tell you I don't think you ought to have that. Well, you know, can't help it. It's what the Lord did for me. God has honored me. What do you want me to do? I've had people tell me that. I said, they say, you look like you're pretty wealthy. I say, it's not my fault. <laughs> it's not. What I do is I remember the Lord thy God. Yes. And it's he that giveth thee power to get wealth. In just a minute, Kurt will come and give the giving instructions on how you do that. Because there's so many outlets. And ladies and gentlemen, this ministry, Kenneth Copeland Ministry, is growing. My God, I'll never forget when I had that, we had that first meeting, me and George. And Rick, you was, we was there in the restaurant in New Orleans and came up with Victory Thon. They said, uh, it was my idea. And they said, you got to go tell Kenneth. Oh, Jesus, God, they're going to beat me to pieces over this. <laughs> Lord, Jesus. And then we went around, boy. I mean, we went, we went round and round. I'm not kidding you. I said, this is your legacy. And I'll never forget what he told me when we finished the first one. Jesse? Actually, he does that. You know how he comes? <laughs> Jesse? <laughs> I thought, uh-oh, uh What? He said, you know, I always saw myself as a broadcaster. You know, you a broadcaster. I said, yes, sir. And I'm a broadcaster. He said, but you made me see myself as a network. Okay. I said, you know, I could see you just pieces of you everywhere. The prophetic realm, the faith realm, the prosperity realm, the salvation realm, everything. I've seen this man when the budget wasn't met in these conventions come up and give all offering away to somebody. Some, some preacher in the audience. You've seen it too. You don't, know, you don't see what's happening in the back. You see people go, oh, Jesus. <laughs> but that's faith. See, he came to the end of his wits. And that's gone. And now the beginning of his faith and it's developed. Kurt, won't you come and show us, get the giving instructions, and I'll see you sometime tonight or tomorrow, okay? God bless. For those of you here in the auditorium, uh, there's information up on the screens. If you'd like to text to give, 36609 and text the word event. Uh, over 17,000 of you are watching right now all over the world, all 50 states and many, many countries. You can be a part of this as well. You see the information right there on your screen. Text event to 36609. Also for the thousands of you literally on Facebook, on Victory Channel and KCM, right in the bottom hand link uh, of the screen right there, you can click that link. It's safe, it's secure, and easy 
easy. And also thousands of you are on the website right now. Simply go to kcm.org forward slash TV event. And also if you'd like to call one of our licensed prayer ministers at 877 877- 281-6297. They'll be taking your phone call and also praying with you. And if you'd like to stick your offering in the mail, feel free to do so. Kenneth Copeland Ministries or KCM, Fort Worth, Texas, 76192. And uh, when the people are ready to give ushers, many of you are already passing the offering buckets already. It's going to be a great, great day. And if Brother Jerry is ready to go, uh, come on up and we're going to have a great afternoon. How many of you are enjoying Southwest 2022? Amen. 42 years we've been doing this here at the Fort Worth Convention Center. And let me just see real quick, how many of you, this is your very first Southwest? Raise your hand. Where have you been? (laughs) How many of you have, this is your 20th Southwest? Raise your hands. Wow. Awesome. Awesome. Well, it's going to be a great afternoon. As I say many times, never leave your future or your fortune to your memory. During this conference, you are getting wisdom that can help you in life, help you in business, help with your family. And I want to encourage you this next session and all these sessions that have happened, even during Prayer Everywhere with Pastor Terry. Take notes. Husbands, this is a time for you to take notes. Don't just sit there and listen, but take notes during these times because when you're going maybe through a tough time in life, you can go back through those notes, and I know it will be a great blessing to you. We're enjoying taking notes and posting them out on social media, and hopefully you're receiving as well. So help me welcome Brother Jerry Seville. everybody doing? You missed a great opportunity to say extremely blessed and highly favored. (laughs) Amen. You can be seated. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, it's good to be in the Believers Convention again. You were just asked how many have been in four of them, your first one. How many in here can say you've never missed a Believers Convention ever? Am I the only one? (laughs) Praise God. I have been privileged to speak in every Believer's Convention here in America, overseas. I'm not sure Brother Copeland can do them without me. (laughs) Well, he probably could, but I hope he don't ever want to. (laughs) Amen. Open your Bibles to Psalm 145 this afternoon. Psalm 145. And while you're turning there, in 1991, right here in this auditorium on that platform, on Thursday night, Brother Copeland was introducing me to speak, and he got ready to walk off the platform before he reached the steps. He turned around and said, wait a minute, Jerry, before you start, uh, the word of the Lord's come to me. And he began to prophesy over me. And uh, I won't give you the entire prophecy. I have it transcribed. It's in my office. But part of it was God is moving you into a new dimension of ministry in the office of the seer. It has, a, has to do with the prophetic ministry. And he said, he's going to begin to show you things to come and then hold you responsible for sharing them wherever he might send you. And so from that moment, I have set time aside usually in the month of October, and ask the Lord, what's on your agenda for the coming new year? And every year since that time, he's given me a prophetic word that I have preached all over America, all over the world, wherever he has sent me, and I don't change that subject until next year. And if I don't hear from him then, I just keep preaching it the following year. But every year he's given me a fresh word that I have emphasized. And uh, this past October, he did the same thing. But just before I get into that, let me just give you some of the titles of those prophetic words since 2010. Uh, That's about as far back as I asked my secretary to look and see. I have them all in my notes. They're all in the archives now. But in 2010, the word of the Lord was above and beyond. 
the year for above and beyond. 2011, a year of supernatural increase. 2012, the year of fulfillment. 2013, the year of unprecedented favor. 2014 will be known as the year of the greater. 2015 will be known as a year of visitations, manifestations, and demonstrations. 2016, the year of the great breaking loose. 2017, the faithful shall flourish. 2018, days of glory, days of abounding. 2019, marvels, wonders, and extraordinary manifestations of the greatness of our God. 2020, a year of the supernatural. 2021, the year of abundant overflow. And then in 2021 of October, he said 2022 would be known as the year of the open hand of God, unusual, extraordinary, and supernatural provision. And here we are in 2022. And I have been decreeing everywhere I've been to begin to expect to experience the open hand of God. There are two specific uh, things referring to the hand of God that I have discovered in the Bible. Uh, one of them, it is a reference to the right hand of God. The other one is a reference to the open hand of God. When you see a scripture talking about the right hand of God, it is usually uh, symbolic of his sovereign power, dominion, and authority. Uh, it was said that this is how God delivered the children of Israel out of bondage, by his right hand, by a mighty right hand, a powerful right hand. And then we see the phrase, the open hand of God. It is usually symbolic of supernatural, extraordinary, and unusual provision. And I think it's very interesting that God would say to me that 2022 would be a year of the open hand of God, particularly in times in which we live right now. Isn't it amazing when the world is screaming worst of times, God is telling his people it could be the best of times. Can you say amen? amen. Now I've been preaching this, as I said, since October. I start out preaching it in our church and then I take it wherever the Lord sends me after that. And of course, every time I preach it, uh, I, I receive more insight into it and I just keep preaching it and keep preaching it and pre keep preaching it and the Lord gives me more and more insight. So I believe I'll just keep right on preaching it. Not only that, but it's working, hallelujah. Amen. In fact, I ask the Lord every year when he gives me that prophetic word that I am to speak and, and please understand, uh, Brother Copeland laid hands on me some time back and said that I had entered into the prophetic office, but I'm not one who prophesies every time I open my mouth. I must be a minor prophet. <laughs> I don't know. It seemed like to me there's some folks every time you see them, I got a prophecy for you. I got a word for you. That's wonderful, but God doesn't use me that way. But when I hear from him, I know I've heard from him. Yeah. And once I hear from him, I'm, I'm bold to decree it. And then I ask him, I said, no, Lord, if you don't mind, would you confirm this word in me before I take it to the rest of the world? Because that way it'll give validity to it. Yeah. Amen. Because God confirms his word with signs following. So in October the 1st, when the Lord said, Tell the people to begin to expect the open hand of God. Now, he did preface it with this. He said, tell them if they will not be moved by all the chaos and all the disorder that is going on in the world today, then I will open my hand unto them and cause them to experience supernatural, extraordinary, and unusual provision. So notice there is a prerequisite. If they will not be moved by all the chaos and all the disorder. Not one amen. amen. If they will not be moved by all the chaos and all the disorder that is happening in the world around them, then tell them, I will open my hand 
and cause them to experience supernatural, extraordinary, and unusual provision. Now, I always, once, once I receive that word from the Lord, the next thing I do is have my art department to put it uh, in some lettering and so forth. And we give every staff member a copy of it. The Bible says, write the vision, make it plain. So he that reads it can run with it. In other words, keep it before them so they'll be motivated by it. Yeah. So I keep this in, in every notebook I've got, every Bible I carry around with me. I have it in my office. I have it in my home. I have it in my shop. I have it in my museum. I put it everywhere. I put it on the mirror in my bathroom. Not only that, but then uh, also we have these little bookmarks made and give everybody in the church a copy of it so that they can carry it around with them, read it uh, as often as they possibly can, and not only read it, but decree it every day. Tell them, I tell them, get up every morning decreeing that this is my year to experience the open hand of God. I will have extraordinary, supernatural, and unusual provision. Amen. And just keep decreeing it every day. Yes. Now, once again, I ask the Lord, uh, confirm this in me so that once I take it to the world, then I will have evidence that I've heard from you. Not only that, I'll have evidence that it works for those who will not be moved by all the chaos and all the disorder that is taking place in the world today. I learned a long time ago to not be moved by what I see. Amen. Not be moved by what I hear. Amen. Not be moved by what I feel. And the first person I ever heard say that was Kenneth Copeland in 1969. And the first time I heard him say it, I'm not moved by what I see. I'm not moved by what I hear. I'm not moved by what I feel. I thought, I am. <laughs> I was moved by everything I saw, moved by everything I, I heard, moved by everything uh, the way I felt. But I learned from him how to change that, praise God. And then I, I come across uh, the Apostle Paul saying these words in Acts chapter 20, verse 24. He was telling the people there, he said, everywhere uh, I go, the Holy Spirit has told me in advance to expect opposition, to expect uh, uh, challenges, adversity. And then the next words out of his mouth was, but none of these things move me. None of these things move me. I stood up in my bedroom that morning. I was probably three months old in the Lord, 1969. And I held that up and I said, God, I'm going to get to the place where I can say like the apostle Paul, none of these things move me. Amen. Well, that didn't happen overnight. Didn't happen in a matter of a few weeks, but it happened. And I am not moved. I am not moved by what I see. I am not moved by what's happening in the world around me. I'm only moved by what I believe. I believe the word of God. So therefore, so be it. Amen. The end. Hallelujah. It's time to praise God. Amen. How many of you can say, I am not moved? <clears throat> say it boldly and say it loud. I am not moved. Say it one more time. I am not moved. Now look at somebody and say, I'm a candidate for the open hand of God. Hey, why don't you go ahead and praise him in advance? Hallelujah. <clears throat> Amen. Now let's look at Psalm 145 and lay a foundation for this. And then we'll continue talking about it throughout the week. In verse eight, the Lord is gracious, full of compassion, slow to anger, and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all. The Lord is good to all. I don't know where you come from, but all in Texas means no exceptions. The Lord is good to all. Amen. Now, of course, I am his favorite, but you come a close second and he's good to you too. Hallelujah. Now, I know he's no respecter of persons, but he's been so good to me. He makes me feel like I must be his favorite. I'm the only one who preaches in Guadalcanal who does not get bugs in their mouth. 
because I have favor. I got, I got so tickled. Those bugs were swarming Brother Copeland like crazy, and they really ganged up on Jesse. <laughs> then the last night I preached, wasn't a bug in the sky. Hallelujah. I walked off the platform. I said, favor. <laughs> Amen. So the Lord is good to all. His tender mercies are over all his works. Drop down to verse 14 uh, for the sake of time. The Lord upholdeth all that fall and raiseth up all that be bowed down. The eyes of all wait upon thee and thou givest them their meat in due season. Now notice the phrase in the next verse, thou openest thine hand. We're talking about the open hand of God. Thou openest thine hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. Notice it's talking about provision, supernatural provision, extraordinary provision, unusual provision. Amen. And you're a candidate for it if you make the decision that you will not be moved by everything that's going on in the world around you today. Amen. Now, one of the first things you're going to have to do is turn the television set off. Put the newspaper down. Amen. Thank God for Victory Network. <laughs> Amen. Because all you're going to hear on that network is faith. Even the news is faith-based. Hallelujah. Isn't that great? Isn't it wonderful to have something that you can actually watch and walk away being inspired and not feeling dejected, depressed, and discouraged? Faith does not come by watching CNN. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Now, something does come by what you see in all the time. Worry, fear, amen. So watch it less. Yeah, but I want to be informed. Well, what's wrong with this book? <laughs> CNN can only report what's happening right now. This book reports what's going to happen in the future. And read the back of the book, like Brother Copeland says, we win. <laughs> Amen? We win, praise God. So notice here, the Lord opens his hand and satisfies the desire of every living thing. So when you see the phrase, the open hand of God, it is usually symbolic of provision, supernatural provision. Now, the Passion Translation reads this way. When you open your hand it's full of blessings. When you open your hand, it is full of blessings. Amen. And who do those blessings belong to? You and me, praise God. We have a covenant with the Almighty. And when God makes covenant, it includes blessings. Amen. God told Abraham, I will bless you. Not only I will bless you, but the Amplified says, and I will give you an abundant increase of favor. So you can't have blessing without favor. Can't have favor without the blessing. They're synonymous. They go hand in hand. They're divinely linked together, praise God. So notice when God opens his hand, it is full of blessing. I, I can't help but think of this. Uh, it comes to my mind every time I, I state that translation. Years ago, uh, Carol and I were, I had just come home from a meeting and we were sitting in our den and I turned the television set on and Creflo was preaching. And I'm sitting there watching Creflo. Now this was many years ago. And uh, the Lord spoke to me and said, call Creflo and tell him you'll be in his church in the morning. I said, Lord, I don't do that. I don't invite myself anywhere. People invite me to come. He said, call Creflo and tell him you'll be in his church in the morning. I said, Lord, I don't do that. I don't invite myself to preach anywhere. They invite me. He said, call Creflo and tell him you'll be in his church in the morning. I said, Lord, I'm already scheduled by invitation from Creflo to be in his church next month. He said, call Creflo and tell him you'll be in his church in the morning. 
Well, how many of you know you're not going to win an argument with God? So I called Creflo. I said, Creflo, you know me. I don't do this, but I'm sitting here watching you on television. And the Lord told me to call you and tell you I'll be in your church in the morning. He said, well, Brother Jerry, you know my house is your house. So if the Lord told you to be here, we'll be expecting you. He said, uh, let me know when you arrive. I'll have somebody pick, up, uh, pick you up at the airport. I said, no, Creflo, I don't want an offering. I'll pay my own expenses. Uh, I, I'm just being obedient to God. He said, well, you're coming back next month, aren't you? I said, yes, I'll be back next month. He said, okay, well, we'll pick you up at the hotel. We'll at least make the hotel arrangements and, uh, and we'll be, expect to see you in the morning. So I got an airplane, flew to Atlanta and landed and they picked me up at the airport, took me to the hotel. Uh, I set my stuff aside and got all ready. And then I said, Lord, you said I had a word for Creflo's church. I'd like to know what it is. <laughs> I, I don't know what it is. I'm just being obedient to God. And uh, uh, so I prayed and, and the Lord gave me a word. And so I went over there the next morning <clears throat> and I began to share that word. Now Creflo and Taffy are sitting right on the front row. And of course, they, they had two services at that time in the morning. And uh, so I was preaching the first service and then we were going to uh, take a break and then come back out for the second service. So I'm preaching along there and I like to walk when I'm preaching. And I got over here to this aisle and there was a guy sitting about where you are, sir. Raise your hand right there that I'm pointing at. Sitting about where this gentleman is. And he got out on his chair like this. I thought, is that guy going to jump on me? So I went back over to this side and started preaching over here. <clears throat> in a little while, I forgot about that guy and I worked my way back over here. I stopped in front of Creflo and Taffy for a little bit and then I got back over and the guy did it again. I thought, surely the usher is not going to let him jump on me. So I, I got back over here, preach a while, and then I forgot about him again, and I walked over here, and this time he jumped up out of the aisle while I was preaching and ran toward me. And I thought, I didn't know what's going to happen. I didn't know if he was mad. I didn't know if he was glad. And he ran up to me and put a $100 bill in this pocket right here and then went and sat down. So I walked over to Creflo. I said, Creflo, apparently he got here late for the tithes and offerings. Uh, put this in the offering. He said, no, that's yours. I said, no, I told you I wasn't going to receive an offering while I'm here this time. He said, no, he wanted you to have that. It's yours. Well, I'm not doing my sermon. I don't want to argue with Creflo. So I just stuck it back in my pocket. <laughs> and then I kept preaching. And then four or five people got up and started doing the same thing. And they, they just totally interrupted me. I didn't know you were allowed to do that. And they kept putting money in my pockets. And, and I kept trying to give it to Creflo and he wouldn't take it. In fact, he was laughing. And so I just kept preaching. And finally, people got up and surrounded me. You couldn't even see me anymore. And every one of them were putting money in my pockets, in my shirt. They stuck it down in my shoes. They, they stuck it in every pocket. They put it in my hands. They put it on the podium. They put it in my Bible. And then everywhere I walked, I, I, I left a trail of money falling out of my <laughs> pockets and my pants and everywhere. And a man got up. An usher got up and had a black trash bag and he was picking it up and putting it in the bag and I'm trying to give the bag to Creflo and he won't take it. So we went back to the, uh, the speaker's room and, and I said, Creflo, I've never seen anything like this before. I've never had anything happen like this before. I said, please put this in your offerings. He said, no, that's yours. The people wanted you to have it. I said, I've never experienced anything like this before. He said, I hadn't either. But it's just a sovereign move of God. And so we went out for the second service. Now, most of the people in that second service were not in the first. It started happening all over again. They, they totally shut me down. I couldn't preach anymore. And this man is following me with a trash bag. I put it in the bag. 
And then when we got back to the speaker's room after that service, uh, I said, Creflo, I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed. I don't know how to handle this. He said, just receive it. The, the Lord wanted you to have it. They, the people wanted to bless you. He said, and when you come back next month, the, the, the church is going to give you an offering, but, but this is for you and Carolyn. Take it home to you and Carolyn. Oh, he included Carolyn. <laughs> now, up to now, up to now, I learned from Jesse, it's she money. She don't know I got it. She ain't getting it. <laughs> That's what Jesse calls she money, right? She money. <laughs> and so... <laughs> Uh, I got ready to, to walk out, and Creflo said, uh, can you stay for lunch? I said, yeah, I can stay for lunch. He said, mama's cooked. I said, oh, definitely I'm staying for lunch. If mama's cooked, his mama can cook, southern style. I feel sorry for folks that's raised in the north. You don't know what, you don't know what southern style is, praise God. And I ate, and I ate, and I ate. And, and Creflo's mother walked over here, and she said, Creflo, I don't think Carolyn's feeding that little white boy. <laughs> that boy can eat. <laughs> I said, pass the chicken, please. <laughs> and then I got ready to walk out, and they were going to take me back to the airport, and the guy with the black trash bag followed me out. Creflo said, take this home. It's yours. So they put it in the car, and I'm, I'm dri they're driving me to the airport, and I've, and I've got this trash bag full of money. I don't know how much. And, and the Lord said, you've just experienced the open hand of God. Now, this, this is way before the Lord gave me this prophetic word regarding this year. But he was teaching me that when God opens his hand, you can expect supernatural, unusual, and extraordinary provision. See, I'd never experienced anything quite like that before. So now it's extraordinary, beyond the norm, unusual. Amen? Not only that, but it was full of blessing. It was full of blessing. Everybody that, that, that God used that morning had a blessing in their hand to put in my life. Okay? So when we got to the airport, my pilot's waiting for me, and, and they gave me that trash bag, and they gave my pilot's the luggage, and and I, I'm carrying the trash bag on the plane. And my pilot said, Brother Jerry, would you like me to throw the trash away? I said, keep your cotton-picking hands off my trash bag. <laughs> now, that's Southern talk, amen. <laughs> and, and he was surprised, because usually if I have any trash, I give it to him, he gets rid of it before I get on the plane. And uh, I said, keep your hands off my trash bag. And I put it in the seat in front of him. All the way home, I just flew home and 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 couldn't stop thinking about that extraordinary experience. So when I got home, I just left my luggage in the car and I walked in the house with a trash bag. <laughs> Carolyn said, what are you doing with that trash bag? I said, you got to hear this. And I told her about it. And then I, I uh, uh, said, I, she said, well, how much is in there? I said, I don't have a clue. So we poured it out in the floor in my study and started counting it. Now, I felt real weird, all this money in the floor in my house. I, I closed the blinds. <laughs> I didn't think, I didn't want anybody that happened to walk up think I stole the offerings. <laughs> I didn't. You can ask Creflo, I didn't. <laughs> but it felt weird because usually, now, Eric travels with me, Joe travels with me, Joe's back here somewhere. Tony travels with me. I don't touch the offerings. The pastors that bless our ministry usually give it to one of these guys. They take it to the accounting department. If I happen to be alone, they would give it to me, and I take it to the accounting department. But I, I, don't, I don't touch the offerings generally, okay? And I don't want anybody ever think I've stole the offerings. So uh, we poured it out on the floor, started separating everything, and when we got through, it was $26,000. $26,000 in cash, all cash. So I put 13,000 over to Carolyn and 13,000 over to me because Creflo said it's yours and Carolyn's. 
she said, well, what are you going to do with yours? I said, I know somebody that's in great financial need right now, and this would go a long ways to help them. So I'm going to give my 13000 to them. She said, that's the same thing I'm going to do. There's some people in the church that need some financial assistance, and I'm going to give it to them. Now, we didn't keep one dime of it. We, we just sold it uh, to people that were in need, okay? And the Lord blessed us afterwards with above and beyond, praise God. Amen. But what I'm saying is we experienced the open hand of God, yes. unusual, extraordinary, and uh, supernatural provision. Amen. And in, the, in other words, it, it came in a way that I couldn't make it happen myself. Don't limit God to what you can do. Let me try on this side of the auditorium. Don't limit God to what you can do. Amen. If you limit God to what you can do, then you're going to stay in the ordinary. You're going to stay in the natural. But God is a supernatural God. He has ways of getting money into your hands and meeting your needs. He has ways that you couldn't dream up in a thousand years. I would have never dreamed up that scenario. It had never happened to me before. But God, amen, he was just demonstrating to me that it is possible. I remember one time right here in this convention, many years ago, Brother Copeland got through preaching one night. We all were going back to the hotel. Jesse and Kathy, uh, Happy and Jeannie Caldwell, I believe Pat Harrison was with us and Carolyn and I and, and John Copeland. We were all in the elevator and the doors were closing. We all pushed what floor we were on. And just before the doors shut, two little hands came through, pushing through, trying to open the door. And I pushed the open button and the doors opened. And there was a lady standing there in a jogging suit. She didn't have a purse. She didn't have a Bible. She just looked like there might be somebody that was staying in the hotel, maybe went for a walk downtown Fort Worth. And, and uh, when I opened the door for her, she said, thank you, pushed the button for her floor. And we went on with our conversation about what Brother Copeland had preached in the meeting that night, discussing it, talking about it. And she got off on the floor uh, before hours. And when the door opened, she turned to me and said, Brother Jerry, God told me this would happen here and handed me a check and walked off. The doors were closed almost before I could say thank you. And I got a check in my hand and inquiring minds want to know. <laughs> now, just before that convention started, I was building a medical facility in the nation of Kenya and I was paying cash for it as I went. And, and we, had, we had completed it, I had thought, and, and uh, Brother Oral Roberts and I were going over to dedicate it. He was going to provide the doctors and nurses. I had built the facility, and uh, we were getting ready to go over and dedicate it. And my director called and said, uh, there's something else we need to do, and it's going to cost X amount of dollars to get it done. Now, in the natural, I didn't have any more money to invest in that project. I had money, but it was designated for other projects, and I can't use it because that's misappropriating funds, and the IRS frowns on that. So I didn't have any more funds to invest in that project, and he told me what we needed, and that check was for that exact amount. Wow. That was unusual. That was supernatural. That was extraordinary. Can you say amen? amen. God is good at that. How many of you can say, my God is good at that? <laughs> now, let me ask you this. How many of you have ever experienced provision in a supernatural way, in an unusual way, in an extraordinary way? Yeah. Would you like to experience it more? Yeah. Well, lift your hand and say, I'm a candidate. Okay. And give the Lord a shout in advance. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Say this with me. To 2022. Is the, is the year of the open hand of God. Hand of God. I, will I will not be moved by all the chaos, chaos and all the disorder, all the disorder in, the in the world around me. And I'm a candidate for supernatural, for supernatural 
extraordinary, unusual provision. Amen. I receive it. And give the Lord your best shout. Hallelujah. Amen. So when he opens his hand, it is full of blessings. One commentary states, and he pours those blessings out until satisfaction is produced. If your favorite song used to be, I can't get no satisfaction, <laughs> get a new favorite song, praise God. God will pour it out until satisfaction is produced. Amen. Amen. What does it mean to satisfy? To meet the expectations of. To meet the expectations of. Now take note of that word expectation. In the Amplified Bible, verse 15, let's look at it in the King James. The eyes of all wait upon thee. The eyes of all wait upon thee. In the Amplified Bible, it says this. The eyes of all wait for you, looking, watching, and expecting. Looking, watching, and expecting. See, you need to get up every morning looking, watching, and expecting to experience the hand of God. Not just while you're in this meeting and then go home and forget about it. No, get up every day. Not only that, but, but decree it. Say it out loud. The apostle Paul said, quoting the psalmist in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13, he says, as it is written, we believe, therefore have we spoken. We also believe and therefore speak. If you believe it, then talk it. Yes. You heard a great sermon about it from Brother Copeland this morning. Another great sermon about it from Brother Keith. And then Brother Jesse touched on it as well. Sounds like to me, God is endeavoring to get across to us. If we want it, talk it. Yes. Amen. 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 With the heart. Brother Keith told us, man, believe it. But with the mouth is how you get from here to there. And he say amen. amen. So talk it. I get up every morning talking it. This is my day, another day for me to experience the open hand of God. I go to bed. Last thing I say before I close my eyes, Lord, the Bible says you neither sleep nor slumber. That means you're going to be up all night. I'm human. I need some sleep. I'm going to sleep. Since you're going to be up all night, you dream up new ways to open your hand toward me. And when we, I get up in the morning, we'll talk about it. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Be it, let it be the last thing on your mind before you close your eyes. Let it be the first thing on your mind and out of your mouth when you get up. Well, I tried that, Brother Jerry. Well, that was your problem. You tried. Do it. Do it. How many of you guys in here are married? Do you remember the ceremony? Yes. Carol and I just celebrated 56 years of marriage. I remember the ceremony. The preacher asked me, do I take this wife, this, this woman to be my wife? I didn't say, I'll try. That's not the right answer. The right answer is I do. If I'd have said, I'll try, Carolyn would have said, that's not the right answer. Tell him you do. <laughs> I've said this many times before. You've heard me say it. Many of you have. I was born with this dimple, but it got deeper when I got married. <laughs> this is where Carolyn grabs me and says, are you listening to me? <laughs> <laughs> you don't try marriage. It won't last. Right. If you do marriage... I mean, you got to do marriage. You can't try the Word of God. You got to do the Word of God. I can't find anywhere in there that says, God blesses the triers. God blesses the doers. The Bible says, don't be a hearer only, but a doer. How many doers are in the house this afternoon? Amen. God blesses people who do the Word. Can you say amen? So notice the eyes of all wait for you, looking, watching, and expecting. It is a known fact that you get what you expect, good or bad, yes. negative or positive. Yes. 
The word expectancy is very closely associated to the word faith, real Bible faith. Jesus said, be it unto thee according to thy faith. He could have just as easily said, be it unto thee according to your expectancy. Because real Bible faith expects God to do something. If you're not expecting God to do something, then are you really in faith? Okay, I got to try this side over here again. <laughs> if you're not expecting God to do something, are you truly in faith? No. Faith expects. Yes. What, what's the sense of praying if you're not expecting results? Amen. Did anybody come here this week expecting results? Yes. Expecting to hear a word from God? Yes. Expecting perhaps healing? Expecting a financial breakthrough while you're here yes. back home? Hallelujah. Yes. If you don't expect something, then just stay in bed. <laughs> Amen. So notice once again, looking watching and expecting, expecting. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm expecting to experience the open hand of God. These confessions are getting weaker and weaker. Say it again. I'm expecting to experience the open hand of God. Don't let it, don't let it fizzle out. <laughs> say it boldly, hallelujah. I'm expecting to experience the open hand of God. And if you're truly expecting it, then demonstrate it with a shout. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. All right. Real Bible faith expects God to do something. The definition of expectancy is anticipation with confidence of fulfillment. Anticipation with confidence of fulfillment. Amen. I believe what God says. Therefore, I expect it to come to pass. In fact, because I expect it to come to pass, I don't walk around with my head down. I don't walk around with a sad face. I walk around with joy. Hallelujah. Amen. In other words, if God said it, then we have every right to expect it to happen because God is not a man that he should lie. If God says that he will open his hand and cause us to experience unusual, extraordinary, and supernatural provision, then who has the right to prevent us from expecting it? Amen. I'm not interested in what anybody else has to say about it. I'm not going to let anybody talk me out of it. And I'm certainly not going to go to a church that's full of unbelief and tell me it's not for me today. It is for me today. It is for you today. Hallelujah. In fact, it can happen this week while you're right here in this convention. Praise God. Amen. Now, Job chapter 22, verse 28, you all know it. At least you've heard it. Thou shalt decree a thing and it shall be established unto thee. Thou shalt decree a thing and it shall be established unto thee. The word established means confirmed, made firm, and brought about. In other words, if you decree it, then God will establish it. He will bring it about. He will cause it to manifest. In the literal Hebrew, the word is, uh, translated established in English literally means if you say it enough, eventually it will become a common occurrence. If you say it enough, eventually it will become a common occurrence in your life. Amen. So that means just saying it while I'm leading you in it in an afternoon service in the Believer's Convention in Fort Worth is not enough. What are you saying when you leave here? Woe is me. Oh, dear God, did you hear what CNN said today? No, I didn't, and I don't want to. I'm decreeing what God says. Amen. 
Don't just decree it while you're here. Say it continually. This is my year to experience the open hand of God. Psalm 35 verse 27 says, let them say continually. Let them say continually. Let them say continually. Continually means unceasing. It didn't say let them say once. Let them say continually. Amen. How many of you wives like to hear continually your husband tell you he loves you? Do you enjoy him saying, I told you when I got married, I hadn't changed. <laughs> that wouldn't go over well with my wife. She likes to hear it. In fact, many times she says, have I told you today I love you? I say, uh, yes, you have. And I love you too. Sometimes I try to beat her to it. Did I say today that I love you? Yes. Well, I want to say it again. Well, darling, I'm telling you now. Yeah. I should have been a recording artist. I, don't, I, I can't sing, but I can remember all the words. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. All right. Say it continually. Look at your neighbor and tell him, say it continually. Not just once. Talk it all the time. Amen. The Bible says in Psalm 104, verse 28, thou openest thine hand and they are filled with good. His hands are filled with good. Why? Because God is good. Everything about him is good. He's the author of good. Amen. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. Amen. That's the reason I know Cajun food came from heaven. It's good. <laughs> Amen. Did you bring me some gumbo yaya? Okay, I'll come home. <laughs> Kathy makes some good gumbo. And she's of God because he's good. Hallelujah. Everything he does is good. Now, the Passion Translation says for Psalm 104, verse 28. He satisfies from his abundant supply. He satisfies from his abundant supply. God is not stingy. Amen. God is not stingy. Paul says in Ephesians 3.20, Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Notice he does exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think. The Amplified Bible even adds this phrase, that we dare to ask and dare to think, dare to pray, dare to, to uh, believe. I, I hear God issuing a dare, a challenge, to ask him for something that in the natural seems impossible. Ask him for something that in the natural is improbable. Ask him for something that in the natural other people say will never happen. God says, whatever you can ask, I'm bigger than that. Whatever you can think, I'm bigger than that. I dare you to ask me for something impossible. Can you say amen? amen. So God is the God that does exceeding abundant above all that we can ask or think. If you can think it, he can do it. If you can ask it, he can make it happen. One more translation says, the Lord opens his hand and gives bountifully all things to enjoy. Gives bountifully all things to enjoy. A lot of people have problems with people that are enjoying the blessings of God. You know, nobody talked ugly about me when I didn't have anything. Nobody wrote an ugly book about me when I had nothing. But once the blessings started coming, once the blessings started coming, there's, there's, uh, we, we've lived out in the country all these years and now Fort Worth has grown our way and all these houses are being built around us. And uh, when that first started a few years ago, 
There was a guy who moved in in one of those houses, and he'd drive by my house. If I happened to be out in the front yard, he's in an old pickup. He'd roll the window down, and he'd scream, Hey, preacher, did you steal the money to build that house? Then he'd drive off real fast. Never give me an opportunity to respond. And then one day I was out there, and I, I, you know, before I went in the ministry, I restored classic cars. And, and my dad raced automobiles. I gave all that up when I went into the ministry, but then God gave it back to me and said, turn what once was your passion into a tool for evangelism. And so uh, I, I have the classic cars and the, and the motorcycles and hot rods, and I use them as tools. We win people to the Lord all over the world. Our chariots are like Christian bikers will turn 25 years old. I started it 25 years ago, and we have kept a record of the salvations. Over 460,000 people have come to Christ just through the motorcycle ministry. So if you've got a problem with motorcycles, get over it. And if you've got a problem with me having a motorcycle, get over it. Don't let the suit fool you. I'm cool. I ride a bad Harley and a bad Indian, and a bad triumph. You mean you have more than one? Yeah. I open my hand and give bountifully all things to enjoy. Now, before you run off and get mad at me, ask my wife how many of them I've given away. Ask my wife how many cars I've given away. How many hot rods, classic cars I've given away. She told me one time, don't you ever give another motorcycle away. I said, why not? She said, they come back to you in fleets and we have to build another garage. I I was on a tour this year in May. I've always wanted to do, my, my heritage is Cherokee Indian on my mother's side. And, and I've always wanted to do a motorcycle tour on the Trail of Tears. Follow the Trail of Tears all the way from Cherokee, North Carolina, all the way to Tahlequah, Oklahoma. Now, I had, I had ancestors that lived on the Cherokee Reservation in Tahlequah on my mother's side. And I've always wanted to follow that. So we, we did our motorcycle tour uh, in May and started in Cherokee, North Carolina and spent uh, about nine or 10 days, just following the Trail of Tears all the way to Tahlequah. Now, before we got to Tahlequah, uh, we, we had a day off and, and uh, we stopped at a Harley dealership, no, an Indian dealership that was in this particular town before we got to the hotel. And we all went in just to look at the new bikes. And, and I walked over to one new Indian and it was beautiful. Oh, it was beautiful. And I sat on it. And it felt good. And a pastor that that oversees our ministry in South Africa and has worked for me for over 25 years, I guess, he came on that tour. He wanted to be on that specific tour. So he came uh, over from South Africa. And he saw me sitting on that bike. He said, Brother Jerry, you look good on that bike. I said, yeah. Uh, He said, do you like that bike? I said, yeah, what's not to like about this bike? He said, well, I have a surprise for you. He said, the church in South Africa sent me here to be on this tour. And they also said, if Brother Jerry comes across something during that tour that he really likes, we're giving you an offering to buy it for him. (laughs) He said, Brother Jerry, I brought an offering. How much does this bike cost? I asked the salesman. He told me, and he says, we got enough to buy it and some leftover. Amen. Every time God opens his hand, there is a bountiful supply. Nothing like that ever happens to me. Well, maybe it's because of your ugly attitude. Okay, let me try on this side now. <laughs> Attitude has everything to do with it. Amen? 
In aviation, your attitude determines your altitude. And the same thing is true in the natural. Your attitude determines how high you go in the things of God, how high you go in the blessings of God. Amen. So don't get mad at me for having more than one motorcycle. Like Jesse said, it's not my fault. It's God who said, I will open my hand. And what did it say in this translation? And I give bountifully all things to enjoy. Now, when you've won 460,000 people to Christ with a motorcycle, then criticize me. Until then, don't worry, be happy. Hallelujah. (laughs) All right, let me close it with this. Tomorrow, I want to share with you some ways that you can position yourself to experience the open hand of God. There's a scripture in the Bible that I'm sure you're familiar with. It's found in Ezekiel chapter 34 and verse 26, and it talks about showers of blessings. Showers of blessings. Another translation says, a downpour of blessings. A downpour of blessings. You ever been in a downpour? You know, people up in Kentucky, we're praying for them that are experiencing that flooding up there. And, and if you've ever been in a flood, um, I mean, sometimes you just have to ride the thing out. You know, we've had downpours here in Texas before. One time years ago, a downpour for days and days and days, and it come up in our house, and, and Carol and I are, are putting... Uh, towels and everything under the door seals and, and everything. And it didn't help at all. The water just kept seeping in. Finally, I just sat on the floor and laughed. I couldn't stop it. I just sat on the floor and laughed. I couldn't stop it. When God causes showers of blessings, you can't stop it. You just have to lift your hands and laugh, hallelujah, and rejoice. Praise God. Amen. Showers of blessing. Now, uh, I'm going to leave you with this, and then we'll get uh, laid this as a foundation for tomorrow. There's one commentary, the Benson commentary, that says this about Ezekiel 34, 26. I will give you remarkable instances of my favor and the joy and the happiness which flows from it and there shall be blessings in great abundance. Remarkable instances of my favor and remarkable, unusual blessings. Hallelujah. So I want to talk to you tomorrow about two predominant ways, actually three predominant ways, that you can position yourself to experience the open hand of God are three predominant ways in which they manifest. For additional messages by Jerry Savelle, come tomorrow. Yeah. Did I whet your appetite? Praise God. All right, let's stand to our feet and let's bless the Lord before we dismiss here. Praise God. Hey, I didn't keep you very long. Hallelujah. So, do you receive that today? Yeah. Lift your hands and shout, I receive it. I receive it. I'm looking for it. I'm watching for it, and I'm expecting it. And turn around and look at somebody and show them what you do when you're expecting something from God. Amen. For all of the almost 18,000 homes right now, we are saying to you right now, you can expect it as well. Thank you so much for joining us online, all of our channels, all of our outlets. Uh, we'll be back at 6.30 Eastern or Central Time, 7.30 Eastern with uh, Prayer Everywhere with Pastor Terry. Of course, Brother Copeland tonight. You don't want to miss it. It all kicks off at 6.30 with Prayer. Also, we want to encourage you, those of you that are on our so- social media platforms, on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, 
uh, TikTok Rumble Getter. You're watching us everywhere today. We thank you so much, and we want to encourage you to continue watching us all week on social media. Also, we want to encourage you, if you'd like more information about becoming a partner with Kenneth Copeland Ministries, we want you to text the word PARTNER to 36609. Again, that's the word PARTNER to 36609. Follow the prompts, and they'll give you all the information. But until this evening, remember, God loves you, we love you, and let's say it together in the arena, Jesus is Lord.